You might be asking, why is the translator up here? I won't understand a word of this. Don't worry, it's a one-off. Um, you'll, you'll be fine. I, am a little, I feel a little guilty because the presentation that I'm going to give is not the briefest, and I know how hot it is, so please forgive me if you see me running out the door later. I see maybe some hateful stares. So. Now, our new sermon series on the book of Daniel is called Hope in a Hostile Land. Pastor Martin will start it officially in two weeks' time with chapter one. Today is really just a little bit of background and prep work to get us ready for the series. It's really less of a sermon, it's more of a presentation. I should pray. Father, help, help, help. Thank you. Amen. Having hope in a hostile land, and I think we all can agree we are living in increasingly in a hostile environment, requires faith. Hope and faith are closely related. The Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. Now, our hope is in a person. The Bible says that uh, our blessed hope is Jesus and his glorious appearing. But right now, we don't see Jesus yet, at least I don't, and we live by faith, not by sight. Now, Scripture said that without faith, it's impossible to please God. We're saved by faith. We, are, we become children of God by faith in Jesus and what he's done on the cross for us. Faith is important. Isaiah said, if you are not firm in faith, you're not firm at all. Now, how does one obtain and sustain this faith? It says in the word, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, the word of God. At the end of this parable of the persistent widow recorded in Luke 18, Jesus asked a curious question. When the Son of Man comes, so when he returns, will he find faith on earth? So by asking this question, Jesus seems to be indicating that faith will be attacked, and of course it has. The enemy has been very busy to attack faith. He uses many tactics. One chief one, he is employed from the beginning. Did God really say? We remember the story in Genesis when he approached Eve in the form of a ser serpent, asking precisely this question. Did God actually say? Calling into question the word of God. And it has reverberated throughout the ages. We even hear it from many pulpits today. Surely a loving God would not call such and such a sin. You can fill in the blank. We have a better understanding now. Surely God did not create the world in six literal days. That's ridiculous. We have signs today. Surely the miracles described in the Bible didn't happen as they were described. They are just a part of a larger story conveying, conveying a moral message. Surely Jesus was not born of a virgin. That's ridiculous. We must understand the original text in a different light. And on and on it goes. Many of today's seminaries and Bible schools are full of this kind of thinking. It's called Bible criticism the use of critical analysis to understand and explain the Bible without appealing to the supernatural. And by the way, much of this school of thought has originated right here in Germany. Now, uh, it has penetrated many churches, like I said, and also many denominations. For example, the Lutheran Church right here in Germany a few years ago put up a statement on their website saying they no longer believe the Bible to be the word of God as much as it is men's attempt to reach God. Now compare that to Martin Luther, their founding father, who 500 years ago would have laid down his life when he said to the council in Worms, ich stehe hier und kann nicht anders, I stand here, I cannot do otherwise. Now the German Lutherans are far from the only denomination that views the Bible as merely a human writing. It's not to be taken too literal, maybe not even literal at all, certainly not inerrant and if inspired, only in parts. Did God really say? The Bible predicted a great falling away, a great delusion taking captive the masses. It predicted the itching ears that would not endure sound doctrine. It has come in like a flood and so much faster than people would have expected. 
Now contrast that to the Apostle Paul who commended the church in Thessaloniki saying, and we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. Now I remember a time in my own Christian walk over a decade ago now, when I had similar questions. I doubted, I started doubting the Bible in parts, and I remember entertaining these thoughts and even selecting scripture passages, thinking those are inspired and others are not inspired. I just found some passages unfair and oppressive. Um, looking back, I realized the arrogance and ignorance in that the Lord has taught me a big lesson since then. The enemy whispers in our ear, did God really say? But the Lord commands us, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your path. I've learned so much since then about the Bible I had not known. I learned about all the amazing archaeological finds that confirm biblical accounts. I learned about the Bible mentioning things that only modern science discovered. I learned about the amazing composition of the Bible, the intricate connections all across from Genesis to Revelation, the stunning cohesion, the one overarching messages from beginning to end. And even though the Bible consists of 66 individual books written by 40 authors that were written over 1,500 years, it's supernatural. Now, but what was most compelling to me was the topic of Bible prophecy. It's something that churches don't like to talk about these days much. It's become a passion of mine, especially as it relates to the times we're living in now that are highly prophetic. Now, I know I'm supposed to give an introduction to the book of Daniel, and before I briefly revisit the topic at the end, let's do that. Let's talk about the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, if you've read it, you might agree, is a fascinating book. In it, the supernatural oozes out of, out of person, per, <laughs> virtually every page. The veil between the visible and invisible worlds is lifted a little bit, and we get glimpses into the heavenlies. Amazingly, already here, we see Jesus approaching his father, the ancient of days. We just sang the song, and uh, many believe that it's Jesus um, that is approaching the father there. We meet angels and demons. We meet a proud world ruler whom God humbles and then raises up again. We read about stunning miracles like Daniel's friends who, were, who refused to bow down to an idol and were preserved in the fire by an angel. And we read about Daniel, who spends a night in the lion's den and is miraculously preserved. We read a puzzling account of a battle between a demon prince and the angel Gabriel that could only be won when Michael the archangel intervened. A strange hand appears on a wall spelling doom for a king. Mysterious beasts are described that are really kingdoms, and uh, strange dreams are given and interpreted by Daniel. The angel Gabriel even gives Daniel an amazing timeline prophecy that points precisely to Jesus' first appearance. Now, the overarching message of the book is God rules. He is in control over everything, including all the affairs of mankind. And the prophet Isaiah uh, could have been a subline to the book when he said in chapter 14, verse 24, the Lord of hosts has sworn, as I have planned, so shall it be. And as I have purposed, so shall it stands, stand. We sense the enormous power in this statement and we are humbled as we are reminded of our own position vis-a-vis -vis our creator. And as Solomon said, the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord, establishes his steps. He is God, we're not. It's perhaps because of this, the humbling message that puts us, mankind, in our place, and also the supernatural events described in the book that read to modern men like fairy tales, and the astoundingly detailed prophecies um, contained in the book, and I believe also because Daniel so clearly points to Messiah, to Jesus and the gospel, that this book, has become one of the most attacked books of the entire Bible. 
secular and also increasingly, like I said, Christian Bible scholars subscribing to aforementioned Bible criticism do not want to reconcile their worldview with what so clearly reveals the supernatural hand of God. They maintain that the book was written much later than it claims, basically after the prophesied events had taken place. They echo the whisper of the serpent. Did God really say? More on that later. Now, in our Christian Bibles, the book of Daniel is grouped in what is called uh, the books of the prophets. There are 17 of them. There's minor and major prophets. That doesn't really say anything about their importance. It just uh, connotes the length of their writings. And so the major prophets are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Of course, Jeremiah also wrote Lamentations. So we are getting ready to study one of the major prophets. Now, while Christians have grouped Daniel in with the prophets, the Jews do not. Um, the Jewish Bible is called the Tanakh, and it's divided into the Torah, the law, and then the Nevi'im, the prophets, and the Ketuvim, the writings. I hope I'm not butchering these names. The Jews put the book of Daniel in the, into the Ketuvim. Why? Uh, because they believe his mission was not that of a prophet. He was a government official in Babylon, and so there's, they say he belongs into the writings. Now, if the Jews do not consider Daniel a prophet, why do you think, why should we as Christians consider him one? Well, one important reason is that Jesus, our Lord and Savior, did. We read in Matthew 24, 15, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. And of course, by saying that, Jesus affirmed Daniel as a prophet, and he also affirmed the book of Daniel by quoting from it. Now, um, Daniel wrote the book of Daniel very likely between 536 and 530 BC, and we know that he is the author of the book because of internal evidence in the book itself and also external evidence in other places in scripture, uh, including Ezekiel. The book of Daniel records the events of Daniel's life and his visions that he saw from the time of his exile in 605 BC until the third year of King Cyrus in 536 BC, so roughly 70 years. Now, when you look at the, the way the book is outlined or structured, um, it can be simply done by just uh, saying that chapters one through six are describing history, the remaining chapters are the visions, the prophecies, but there's a more interesting way to look at it, and it's interesting how the Holy Spirit composed it or engineered it, because uh, the book of Daniel is unique in that it uh, is written in two languages, both Hebrew and Aramaic. Aramaic is related to Hebrew uh, and was the trade language of the day, like English is, is today in the world. And uh, if you see chapter 1 until chapter 2, verse 4, are written in in Hebrew, that's really a message to Israel. And then chapters two, verse four, and until the end of chapter seven are written in Aramaic. Those are messages to the Gentiles. And then the remaining chapters are written again in Hebrew. Now, the Jews are in captivity in Babylon, and uh, the, you might ask why. Um, if you remember, even from the time when God, with his mighty hand and his outstretched arm, freed them, freed them from captivity in Egypt, they had a troubled relationship with God and immediately started worshiping idols and sinning. And as Brad Parks reminded us a few weeks ago, most of the kings in Israel, even after the kingdom was divided, were bad kings. There were only a few exceptions in the south and the southern kingdom, Judah, uh, among them Asa, Hezekiah, Josiah, and uh, so Daniel uh, acknowledges the sins in his prayer uh, that's recorded in the ninth chapter of Daniel uh, when he says, the curse and oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. And here he is referring to the curses that are found in the 28th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy because God's promises were not unconditional to Israel. Uh, they, they were dependent on their obedience. And so it reads, if you're not careful, um, Moses writes in Deuteronomy, if you're not careful to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, then the Lord will bring on you and your offspring extraordinary afflictions. You shall be plucked off the land that the Lord, that you are entering to take possession of it, and the Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other. 
Um, and because the people of Israel had not been obedient, even after having been sent warning after warning after warning, um, God would basically reverse what he had done. So he had taken, him, taken them out of captivity, they would go back into captivity. This has played out a number of times in Israel history, and even before the Babylonian captivity that affected the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom, Israel, Israel was sent into captivity when the Assyrians uh, captured them. That was 120 years before. Now, there is an interesting verse in the, same chap in the same chapter in the book of Deuteronomy, verse 36, that is a prophetic warning that was fulfilled precisely in the Babylonian captivity. It reads, the Lord will drive you and the king you set over you to a nation unknown to you or your ancestors. There you will worship other gods, gods of wood and stone. And it was that for Judah, before the captivity in Babylon, Babylon was, they were fairly unacquainted with it and they had to, they were forced to worship other gods unless they were like Daniel and his friends who uh, even risked their lives by refusing to do so and they wanted to remain faithful to God. Now God is a compassionate God as I mentioned. He sent warning after warning. He doesn't want to punish anyone. But there's one king in particular that is mentioned in scripture, one king of the kingdom of Judah, that, was, that ended up being the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back for God. That's King Manasseh. He's the uh, son of good King Hezekiah, relatively good King Hezekiah. And he took to the throne when he was 12 years old, when his father had died, and got, he became really bad. He got involved in black magic. He began worshiping other gods. He even burned his own sons to death as a sacrificial offering to the god Baal, to the false god Baal, I should say. His murderous cruelty became so bad that we read in 2 Kings 21, Manasseh had shed so much blood that it covered Jerusalem from one end to another. Now, in 2 Kings and in Jeremiah, it states that because of his sins, the Lord would not pardon. And it's interesting because his grandson uh, later um, Josiah, King Josiah, he uh, instituted sweeping reforms. He repented on a large scale, but God would not would not relent. He would still send Judah into captivity. And it's also interesting because Manasseh himself repented at the end of his life, and he was restored. So on a personal level, he uh, was given grace, but the nation, it, they had crossed a red line. And we're reminded of what it says in the New Testament, the kindness and severity of our God. There is, there is a day or there's a line when judgment can no longer be deferred. Now, um, the captivity didn't happen all at once. It happened in three stages. The first one in 605 BC, when Babylon had won a decisive battle against Egypt. They, they uh, put Israel under siege and then uh, took captives to Babylon, among them Daniel and his friends. Then eight years later, after the remaining uh, Jews in the land rebelled, uh, 597 BC, they, uh, Babylon came back, took more captives, and then the, the, the most horrendous one was in 586 BC under King Zedekiah. Um, they rebelled again in Judah, and Babylon said, okay, we've had enough. Uh, we're coming, and they burned Jerusalem to the ground and also destroyed the temple, Solomon's temple. And it happened, that destruction of the temple happened on the 9th of Av, the Jewish month of Av that happens in July and August. And it's interesting because many hundreds of years later, the, it, it would happen again on the same day when the second temple was destroyed by the Romans. So, so we see, um, that's interesting. So how long would this punishment last? How long would the Jews be in captivity? And Daniel tells us in Daniel chapter 9 before he prays, because he was a man of the word of God. He was in the word. He was a man of prayer and uh, of the word. And he read Jeremiah the prophet and believed what he wrote. And Jeremiah in um, Chapter in the chapter 25, verse 11 states, this whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So why 70 years, you might ask? It's important to note that God is very precise. There's nothing random or arbitrary in his word. Nothing is inconsequential. Details matter. So why 70 years? In Second Chronicles and in Ezekiel, we learn why. It was because the 
the Jews had failed to keep what is referred to as the Sabbath of solemn rest for the land that was to have taken place every seventh year after six years of farming. So it's not the weekly Sabbath that's stipulated in Leviticus 25. So if, if God required 70 years precisely of them, that meant that for 490 years they had been disobedient. So as prophesied in scripture, and uh, scripture is very precise, prophecies are given and fulfilled down to the letter. Uh, after 70 years, um, they were freed by decree of King Cyrus. And that's another very fascinating thing because Isaiah the prophet had prophesied that King Cyrus would come on the scene 150 years, 150 years prior, even by name. He named him by name. And so he issued that decree that would release uh, the captives and they could go back to the land. Now this whole experience in Babylon was had a significant impact on them. They would never again be corrupted by idolatry and the false gods surrounding them. Now to our protagonist and the writer of the book, the person Daniel, there's not that much known about him. Uh, he's of course famous for having survived the, dion, the lion's den. Um, and he was uh, deported as a teenager to Babylon in 605 BC, as I've mentioned, he was likely 17 years old or a little younger. Now, interesting is his name Daniel, because that's Hebrew for God is my judge or God rules me. And if you remember, the overarching theme of the book is God is in control, God is sovereign, God rules. So the Holy Spirit even put that little detail even in the name. So, you know, just to reinforce the message. In Babylon, he was renamed Belteshazzar, which was quite an insult because Belteshazzar means Beltis protect the king. And who is Beltis? Beltis is a goddess in the Babylonian mythology. And she was referred to as the mother of the gods and queen of heaven. And she was often depicted as a woman holding a little child. And I can assure you that the worship of her, even under a different name, has not died out. It happens on a large scale around the world, and you can take a guess where. Um, um, Daniel is likely from an upper class family. We read that in Daniel 1.3. That's in uh, fulfillment of another prophecy that Isaiah gave to King Hezekiah, also affirmed extra biblically by uh, Josephus, the historian, the Jewish historian. Um, he was faithful to God in a very hostile environment. He was, a, like I said, a man of prayer and the word of God, and um, even when faced with persecution, remained faithful. He's called greatly loved by God, and that's interesting because there's another one who came much later who was also called beloved, and he was also given apocalyptic visions, the Apostle John. And those two books, the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel, go hand in hand. He, Daniel is even referred to as the key to understand the book of Revelation. So um, that's interesting. And Daniel is called righteous, one of the few that is called righteous by God in Ezekiel 14, 14, alongside Noah and Job. God gave him great wisdom and understanding, and he was also given the ability to interpret dreams. And that, in turn, helped him to be raised to a very high position in Babylon. And that again, helped him to help his country, countrymen, the Jews, when they came in, in more numbers to Babylon to lead a more tolerable life than they would have otherwise. And maybe that reminds us of someone who had gone before Daniel, even almost a thousand years before, who was also, as a youth, taking, taken into the land of captivity, was also given the ability to decipher dreams and was also raised to a very high position. That is, of course, Joseph, who is a type of Jesus in the Old Testament. Now, as I'd mentioned earlier, the book of Daniel is probably the most attacked book of the Bible. The first recorded critic was Porphyry. He was a third century AD philosopher, and he wrote a work, a series of books, 15 of them, called Against the Christians. In them, he denounced Christianity and also the book of Daniel. He said it's a fake. It was written in the Maccabean period. That would be roughly 167 to 134 BC. And to this day, critics follow the lead of Porphyry and question the book's validity on, on these points. They say it's historically accurate, the prophecies were written after the fact, and Daniel is certainly not the author. 
Now, that should not be surprising. Generations of us have been educated uh, in a society that has accepted rationalism as the basis of all its education. And it has become almost like a religion in its own right. The concept of a real God who controls history and the affairs of mankind, a God who is sovereign and tells men and women how they ought to live life is unacceptable to most. It seems foolish to them, but let's remember, God says in his word, but God shows what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, and the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. Perhaps the lofty sounding claims, the wisdom of the world, the sophisticated arguments that hold so many in their sway and deter them from believing in what God said may not rest on such a firm and solid foundation after all. And we don't have time to go into all the claims, and there's just a few of them that I listed on the slide that represent what is said against Daniel, or the book of Daniel. But let's look uh, just at claim number two. We had already talked a little bit about that, that it's claimed that it was written in 168 BC or after. And uh, when you Google the book of Daniel, you might uh, hit Wikipedia, and it states, the book of Daniel is a second century BC apocalypse from Judea with, sixth century, with a sixth century BC setting, ostensibly an account of the activities and visions of Daniel. You can hear the tone in that statement that is given so matter-of-factly, which is actually not fact. Um, we have ample evidence for all those claims and for all the others as well that Bible scholars have presented and um, debunked these claims sufficiently, and none of these hold water. Um, you have to dig in a little deeper to, to see that, though. Uh, on the surface, of course, um, these arguments might and are unfortunately compelling many. Um, so when it comes to um, the dating, um, we, we know, for example, that Daniel was included in the Septuagint. That's the earliest version is, I believe, dated 255 BC. Also, Ezekiel referred to Daniel, and he's dated 593 to 565 BC. And then the Jewish historian Josephus, who was in the first century AD, he references Daniel, and it's interesting because he records that when Alexander the Great came to Jerusalem in 330 BC, the high, he, uh, he was on um, he was bent on, on destruction, but the high priest came to Alexander the Great with a scroll of the book of Daniel, and he showed him the passage that talked about him that Daniel had prophesied. And it doesn't name Alexander the Great, but it's, it's a very detailed description that matches him to a T. And he read it, and he was stunned. He actually ended up sacrificing to the Lord God, the true God, because of what he'd seen in the prophecy. It's like, that's me. Um, also, uh, of course, we are fortunate after World War II in the, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls had been found in Qumran, and um, there were many writings by the Jewish sect that lived around that area, the Essenes, and um, dated to uh, the second century BC, and they were heavily influenced by the book of Daniel. Of course, in those times, they didn't have the internet, so news traveled very slowly, so that shows us that the book of Daniel must have existed a long time before that. Now, also claim six. Um, there are certain people named in the book of Daniel that, uh, where we don't yet have any evidence, any archeological uh, evidence or in the historic record. And that was reason that people would ready, ridicule believers and say, how can you believe in such, something like that? It's, it's not accurate historically. Um, so for example, Darius the Mede. As far as I know, there's no evidence yet for him, but they forget the same ridicule was leveled against believers when it came to someone else named in the book, Belshazzar. He is named as the king um, that was the last king of the kingdom of Babylon, and when this hand with the writing appeared, then he, in the same night he was killed. And, and uh, for the longest time there was no evidence, and uh, in the historical record, a Nabonidus is named as king. Now. God is patient, right? He will allow mockery for so long, but then at some point he will vindicate. It says God is not mocked, not in the long, not in the long run. And so in the late 1900s, archeological evidence was found for Belshazzar, and it turns out he was the son of Nabonidus. Nabonidus was the king, but he left 
the government with his son because he pursued other interests. And so he, uh, Belshazzar became the second in line. That also explains why Daniel was made the third highest ruler after he deciphered um, the writing. Now we could look, uh, spend hours more, and we don't have that time, and I know it's warm, um, to look at the specific attacks and claims. However, at the end of the day, um, even with all the rational arguments, it's still something we have to decide in our hearts. What do we believe? And whom do we believe? Now, I believe the book of Daniel forces a decision. When you read it, there's no room for middle ground. If you really engage with the text and allow it to touch you, I believe you must make a decision. You must take sides. The question is, do I believe God's, inspired, uh, God's word to be inspired, literal and infallible? Do I trust God and lean not on my limited human understanding? Or do I side with the masses who find all kinds of sophisticated, very intellectual sounding arguments against the word of God? There's a professor of Hebrew at the University of Oxford who lived in the 1900s. His name is Edward Pusey. And he wrote a book called Daniel the Prophet in the, in the 1900s. And he said, the book of Daniel is especially fitted to be a battlefield be between faith and unbelief. It admits of no half measures. It is either divine or an imposture. To write any book under the name of another and to give it out to be his is in any case forgery, dishonest in itself and destructive of all trustworthiness. But the case as to the book of Daniel, if it were not his, would go far beyond even this. The writer, were he not Daniel, must have lied on a most frightful scale, ascribing to God prophecies prophecies which were never uttered, and miracles which are assumed never to have been brought. In a word, the whole book would be one lie in the name of God. So as we study the book of Daniel in the next few weeks and couple of months, let's be honest with ourselves. Let's see where we are with our faith, how strong is our faith. The elders call this series Hope in a Hostile Land. Things will get darker around us, more hostile. And if we're honest, we know they already have. We will need strong faith. If you decide for faith, I can assure you that you have a very strong foundation to stand on. You have incredibly good reasons to hope. And that, that leads me to my last point, and I can't see the clock. Okay. Um, and that has to do with what I mentioned, the Bible prophecy of which the book of Daniel is full of and the whole Bible is full of. And um, as I mentioned, the, the Lord used it in my life to, to convince me that the Bible is indeed his word. And it's unique to the Bible. There's no other so-called holy book that can boast what the Bible offers in terms of Bible prophecy. Not, not the Quran, not the Hindu Vedas, no other book. And um, there are hundreds of them that have already been fulfilled and that should it give us that assurance God is sovereign and also that all that what, which remains to be fulfilled will be fulfilled. Now, in fact, pre fulfilled predictive prophecy is the litmus test that God himself put in his word for himself and for his word that we can know it's his word. And when he was mocking the false gods and idols of Israel, saying in Isaiah 41, verse 22, he was saying, ha, declare to us the things to come. Tell us what is to come hereafter that we may know that you are gods. It says in Isaiah 46, verses 9 to 10, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. He is God and he alone. Now, as I mentioned, the Bible is full of prophecy. In fact, John Payne in his Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy counted 8,352 predictive verses of future events. That's 27% of the entire Bible. Every fourth verse in scripture deals with prophecy. God wanted us to be extra sure that we would know it's his word by the fulfilled prophecy. And there are so many amazing ones, and I already pointed out 
the amazing timeline prophecy that Daniel was given by the angel Gabriel that precisely shows when Jesus would appear for the first time. There's many, many others. And I pray that even during the series or afterwards, alongside perhaps, we will have opportunity to look into these in more detail. It will really uh, encourage you and strengthen your faith, I believe. And also our understanding of scripture overall, because it sets a pattern of how God uh, communicates. Now, just to finish, if we try to conceive the odds of Bible prophecy, of fulfilled Bible prophecy, just to give you an understanding of how, how, uh, how robust that foundation is that we rest on with our faith. The odds of winning the lottery are, are estimated to be one in 259 million. Now the odds of eight, only eight prophecies being fulfilled is one in a number I cannot read. It's 10 to the power of 17. But there are over 1,000 fulfilled Bible prophecies, already fulfilled Bible prophecies. Now you would have to fill the entire universe known universe with little marbles and one of them being of a different color to the rest and then you send someone out and they grab a marble and pick this differently colored marble that's the chance that all of these prophecies that have been fulfilled have been fulfilled by accident does that compute like how strong our foundation is that we rest our faith upon, we will need this in the, in the days to come. Because, because when I studied Bible prophecy, I also discovered that in the last 120 years, since the late 1900s, over 100 of them have been fulfilled, and many are ongoing. And it goes like this. So in the late 1900s, you know, there were a few, and it, it just keeps, keeps growing. Think exponential curve. And that's something that Jesus pointed to when he talked about the birth pains. Many of these prophecies have to do with Israel and the regathering and coming back into the land. Also, the taking of Jerusalem, 1967. And I know Israel is a, a sensitive subject these days with the Gaza war, and we are not condoning that. Uh, but God has his eye on this nation, that's for sure. No other generation before us, no other generation before us can look back on so many prophecies that were fulfilled that have to do with the last of the last days because all of these prophecies I was just talking about have, are tied to the last of the last days. Brothers and sisters, I know we cannot know the day or the hour and I'm not saying Jesus is coming back tomorrow. I'm not able to set dates, no one is, and we've seen all the false dates that have been set that are actually numbing us to where we are right now in terms of Bible prophecy. The hour is late. It's time to awake. It's time to make use of the time we have left. So let's pray. Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, you said in your word that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. And you're coming. You're coming again. We don't know how soon, but I know it's soon. It's sooner than most people realize and expect. Oh, Lord, right now we still have grace. Right now we can still come to you. We can still unburden the load when you said, come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest, rest for your soul. We pray, Lord Jesus, that many, many, many will still be drawn to you and, and put, their, put their faith uh, in you for salvation, for the rebirth, for being able to enter the ark before judgment comes. Lord Jesus, I pray that this church will be a light to the city of Berlin and the surrounding area and even all around the world, that your spirit here will, will uh, just work in a mighty way, Lord. Please touch our hearts, ignite a fire right here in Jesus' name. Amen.